Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Bitwig Studio and Music Production. This is lesson six. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about the analog to digital conversion process, um, the inverse of that, which is the digital to analog conversion process. And then we'll have one more little talk about the differences between analog signal and digital signal. And again, I'm going to just reemphasize this point. When we're talking about analog signal and we're talking about anything analog, we're talking about the real world. So as things exist in the real world, which is continuous. All right. So what happens when we record into our computer or we take any kind of data and bring it into our computer, it has to be digitized, meaning it has to go from something that's continuous into something that is made up of ones and zeros because that's all the computer speaks and understands is code is ones and zeros. And with those ones and zeros, the computer can do a lot of things, but the actual file itself needs to be converted into a form that the computer can understand. And then of course it can relay to us information and allow us to manipulate that code in a variety of ways and in ways that we actually can't do in the analog domain. So analog to digital converters, this isn't just true for audio, it's true for video, it's true for, like I'm saying, anything that has to come in. And I'll give you guys a few examples of that, but obviously this is all about music production. So we're gonna focus on the musical elements first. Uh, but for some of my examples on the differences between analog and digital, we're actually going to be looking at film because I can give you guys a much better understanding of the concept through film than through audio because I can't necessarily play you guys something that's truly analog because you're going to be watching this through the computer, which is digital, and through a compressed video, which again is all digital. But uh, we'll start with the most basic of analog to digital converters, and that's the one that exists within within your computer, um, especially if your computer has a microphone input. So on the MacBook Pro here, this is where the um, microphone input is. So when you talk, it's going to be recording from here. So inside of this little slit here, there is a um, analog to digital converter that's going to measure the variation in vibrations in waves and it's going to be able to record that so let's just actually run through the process of recording i'll do it in bitwig for this example i have it all set up to work and i have the monitoring turned off so when i record this what we're going to actually see is the analog to digital process taking place so let's go ahead and do that now this is a test of the analog to digital conversion process. All right, let me just put on my headphones real quick to make sure everything went according to plan. And so I can play this back. This is a test of the analog to digital conversion process. So probably the first thing you're gonna notice is that the sound that you guys just heard there when I played that back is very different from my voice that you're hearing right now. The reason for that is because I'm actually using different analog to digital converters. So for what you're hearing now, my voice talking to you, I'm running through a independent um, audio sound card device and using a different microphone which is going to sound very different to you guys than when I record through uh, my input, my internal computer. So I can just show you guys what I have set up. So right now the input device for Bitwig is going through the built-in microphone, but if I were to change it to this Duet USB here, you would hear something very similar to what you're hearing right now, but we're using the built-in microphone and we're using the analog to digital converter that exists within my MacBook Pro, nothing external, all built into the computer. All right, so what happened when I recorded was it took that analog signal and immediately converted it into a digital file, into something that's ones and zeros. To store something analog, to actually get it properly, it has to be on something real. It has to be on a resource. So for example, when you record onto vinyl or you record onto tape, it is actually tracking that analog signal. It's not turning it into code. It's just taking that real world continuous value and it's plotting it out on that particular um, medium there. So I'm just gonna show you guys a couple of other um, devices, but before I do that, let's talk about the inverse first, which is 
digital to analog conversion. And so this actually occurs when I play back, when I click play on this, what's happening is, again, the computer is sending out this digital information into a analog converter. And from that analog converter, it's going through the output of my computer and then into your ears or out of your computer speakers or into your headphones. If you've ever seen how speakers work, a good example of that is when you have like very small speakers that have a little subwoofer cone and you can see the subwoofer bouncing in and out really hard. Um, that is basically the way the speaker is attempting to interpret that analog information because sound is of course um, waves coming out so just it disrupts the air pressure level and so the cone is bouncing in and out really hard attempting to generate those waves generate something analog generate something physical it's not something you can see but it still is physical molecules are moving around air pressure is being compressed and then rarefied and that's what allows you to hear sound. So even when you're outputting through your computer output and into your headphones, that still has to come out as analog signal. And that's the only way that our brains are going to be able to hear it. We can't hear ones and zeros, obviously, but what we can hear is analog signal. So I wanted to just walk you guys through a couple of other um, audio interfaces that exist. Hopefully my computer will work here and won't completely bug out because right now we are stall in here okay perfect so here's an example and we're going to go from something very cheap to something very expensive within this box is a a to d and d to a converter so we have a place here to put in input and then a place for outputs okay so if we go into our inputs and then we record something that is going to be analog to digital coming back out and into our ears and into the world is going to be digital to analog. This is a very cheap example, but we also have something like this. This is the UAD Apollo audio interface. It's something like $3,000, where I think you can get this for like under 50. Um, and in this audio interface, there's a whole lot more going on. We have a lot more inputs. We have more outputs, right? We have um, a lot of other controls and things on here that it really isn't that much different from this, but one of the reasons why you would get a more expensive audio interface is for the analog to digital converters, or I should just say for the converters, the A to D and the D to A. People will spend a lot of money if they believe that those converters are better, and some perhaps are better, some are worse. It's all relative to what you're going for. And I think you could probably read the specs that are specific to the converters within these boxes, but um, it's that stuff goes way above my head. I wouldn't be able to tell you from a specification why one analog to digital converter is better than another. With sound, it's all about listening and it's about making those choices based on what sounds best to you. So for one last time, actually we'll do this another time in a future video, but we're gonna talk about the differences between analog signal and digital signal in a different medium. So like I said, the real world consists of all analog um, signals. So sound, just if you were in this room with me and you were listening to me talk, what you're hearing would be an analog signal uh, early forms of photography and of filmmaking were all done purely in the analog domain and same with music. So let's talk about all three of those first. We'll start with music, then we'll talk about photography, and then we'll talk about film. And I'm going to show you guys exactly the aesthetic difference of uh, film versus digital with a few examples. But let's start with music. Okay, early on, music was recorded directly to vinyl. There was no way you could really make any edits to that recording. Once it was on there, once it was grooved in and cut and the needle was dropped, that was it. There was nothing you were going to be able to do to change that. Eventually, we changed our um, medium we recorded to, for the most part, to tape. Okay, And so with tape, you could actually record onto tape. Again, it's a continuous signal. It's an analog signal. But the flexibility of tape allowed you to actually cut the tape, physically cut the tape, and you could paste it in other places. And that's sort of the beginnings of music concrete, where you would take a bunch of different sounds, a bunch of different recordings on tape, and you could cut the tape up, and you could splice it together in different and unique and interesting ways. 
But again, the computer was never involved. This was all done in the analog domain. Let's jump ahead to the 70s and the 80s. And eventually we have these sort of multi-track consoles, mixing consoles, that would allow for multiple inputs, all of which are still analog, to be recorded at the same time and to be manipulated differently. And that's what I showed you with that console, that Neve console before. Again, the computer is not used, but you have multiple inputs that you can process separately. And all of the processing, again, is analog. All of this is hardware. The computer is not being at all, involved at all. There are no ones and zeros. It's just been in the past 20 or so years that people have begun going away from analog into digital. And the reason for that, there are a ton of reasons, but one of them is cost. Because with digital technology, it's become so much cheaper for everybody if you just have a laptop and you have sound coming out of it in a software program that can take that sound and you can manipulate it, boom, suddenly you have the ability to make music. You don't need a hundred thousand or a million dollar studio to uh, do something interesting with sound and to thus effectively produce music. Also, the thing to remember about analog is because it is continuous and because you have to literally plug these things in and connect and physically connect them with cables and wires sound is going to be introduced into the signal there's no way to avoid that you know that's just part of working in the analog domain because you're picking up everything so if you're picking up everything there's going to be moments especially with current where you're just going to get these bursts of sound and so that's kind of where you get that um record hiss and the wire hiss and wire hum so people would try to record louder to eliminate that however it's become kind of so ingrained in our heads and in how we listen to music that a lot of us have become so used to that record crackle and that um, wire hum the, the um, electrical feedback the noise if you will and so it's actually become something that a lot of us really like. And a lot of digital tracks now will actually sample just that record crackle, just that psh, 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 noise and put it into their records to try to add some sort of, uh, I don't know, retro old school quality to a song that's been completely made inside of a computer and in a d digital audio workstation. So that is what I want to say about music production. And the other thing I want to mention just briefly is once you start working in a digital realm, once this file has been converted to ones and zeros, you are going to take away some of that analog quality because the computer has limits, it has peaks. You can set resolutions for how you're actually going to sample audio coming into your computer. And it's very important to understand that once it becomes ones and zeros, you can't suddenly make it an analog signal that hasn't gone through that process. So people will today a lot of times make a track completely in a digital audio workstation with all digital media files. And then upon exporting, they'll actually run it to tape again. And that will add something to the signal. It's going to add noise. It's going to add character that you can never get within the computer, but you've still gone through the digital process. So it no longer is a completely analog track. There are analog purists in music, just like you're going to hear there are analog purists in both photography and film. And in audio, there are analog purists who only want to work in the analog domain because they believe that the quality of analog sounds better or richer to their ears than the quality of digital. Digital, excuse me. And that is a completely creative choice on your end. Most of us, though, don't have the money and don't have the resources to work completely in analog. So what do we do? We work in digital, and then we look for digital emulations of uh, creating analog type effects because we still enjoy that pleasing sound, but we can't afford to actually work with the real hardware. And there's never going to be a software instrument or a software effect that can recreate analog perfectly. It's just not possible because you're working in ones and zeros. So you can see how all this stuff kind of ties in and uh, makes a lot of sense. So before you have that argument with your friend about analog versus digital, I hope you can remember what I've talked about here. In photography, it's much the same way. When you shoot directly to film, to a physical medium, you're working entirely in analog. When you take a picture and it produces a JPEG file or any dot 
whatever file that's not hard it's not it's not physical there is a analog to digital conversion taking place and so let's say you have a really fancy dslr camera or something you snap a photo and you bring it into photoshop when you're bringing it into photoshop photoshop is going to be taking that analog um that analog source and converting it into something digital that then you can manipulate and mess with and play around with. And again, you have the choice then from there to print it out to something physical, to something analog. But again, it's already gone through that digital process. So what you're doing is kind of adding this fake layer of analog to something that's already been digitized. That's fine. It produces a very interesting um, aesthetic quality to it but you're not working entirely in analog. If you just snap a photo and print it, that right there is analog start to finish. The computer hasn't touched it. There hasn't been any digitization of the file. And so that's what you've got. Last but not least, I want to talk about film because here is where I can actually really explain this to you guys in, um, in a very obvious way. So back at the beginning days of film technology, people would shoot directly to hard film to the actual stock itself. And of course, then if they wanted to make changes to it, if they wanted to make edits to it, they would have to physically cut the film and then paste it back together. I'm simplifying the process. You can look it up on YouTube and actually watch people do this, but all of it had to be done by hand. There was no computer involved. And one of the best ways you can see this difference between analog and digital today is by watching films from the past that were all shot using film, or if they used color, they were actually, you know, physically um, developed in a lab somewhere. Again, all totally analog, no computer, no code. And I want to start by showing you guys a couple of clips here. This is from The Red Shoes, and if you ever have the opportunity to see this on film where it hasn't gone through any digital process, it's really a sight to see just for this one sequence in the film. Uh, this is like the dancing sequence. This is the ballet sequence, and I'm just going to click play, and I want you guys to just watch these colors. Just notice the vibrancy and the saturation to these colors, and as we go through and look at some other clips, you're going to see uh, very big difference. So even these oranges, especially the reds of the shoes, uh, Technicolor produced not something lifelike, not something real that we would consider to be accurate to what we see, but it provided a very interesting and unique aesthetic and made these reds especially super, super vibrant. And it made a lot of, um, you know, yellows and stuff very warm and very rich. So let's just jump through here quickly. Again, no computer was involved. This is all analog, and this is all like analog color, if that makes any sense to you guys. So just get a look at this, some beautiful sets. And again, if you can watch this entire sequence, I really encourage you to do it. But you have to remember that when you're watching it here, there has been a analog to digital process that's taken place. However, we can still see some of those nuances in color. But if you were to watch it on film as it was originally made, you would even get a uh, greater effect here. Okay, so that's just one clip I want to show you. We can also look at vertigo here. Um, this dream sequence will give you another good idea of what's going on. So these sorts of blues, and especially the reds, which you're going to see in a second, are things you simply cannot do digitally. You can try. There are a lot of filters that exist, you know, in Final Cut Pro and whatever, but you're never going to be able to get this exactly. And this has, again, gone through a, a digital process. It's on YouTube, so this is all ones and zeros. Just look at the uh, richness and the uniqueness of these colors. Without uh, having the context of what's going on in the movie at this point, you're probably freaking out a little bit. Uh, jump ahead a little bit.
Okay, so that was from Vertigo. And now I just want you guys to compare the effect of the color, of the aesthetic, of the actual um, saturation of those colors to what you're going to see in a much more modern, fully digital film. So this is from the latest uh, Thor movie, I think. Jeez, what is up with these pop-ups? And so the color here might seem a lot more real to you guys. And that's because this has all been done digitally. So remember with analog, like we talked about, there's certain feedback that's going to come into that signal where with digital, we can really cut back on that. So you have something that appears uh, a lot more realistic to our eye. But again, it's all ones and zeros. It's just been able to cut out those other subtle distortions that come into an analog signal. All right, that's probably enough of that clip. And just one last example here. I couldn't help but resist to do this. Um, here is, of course, The Wizard of Oz, one of the most famous movies for its vibrancy of color for the uh, Technicolor uh, technology at the time. Let's mute that out here. And so here we have uh, Dorothy coming into the world of Oz. I'm not sure why it's playing like this. But focus on these colors. Look at these yellows. Look at these reds. There's just such a unique kind of filter to Technicolor that you just can't get with digital. Jump forward if we want. Uh, let's see. Let's just go back around here. We get a lot of different colors going on. Absolutely beautiful. Colors are just uh, stunning in this. And now let's compare it to the film that just recently came out here, Oz uh, the Great and Powerful, the Disney remake, what you're going to notice right away is that this black and white, this is a, a filter. This is a, a digital filter. This isn't actually being shot onto black and white film. And it's so crisp and it's so clean, it actually just looks a little hokey. Especially when you get James Franco screaming his brains out. And I think what Disney was trying to go for here when they made the switch from black and white to color was something of a similar effect to the original Wizard of Oz. But there is just there's no comparison. Uh, these are all going to be digital colors that you're going to see here in a second. Let's see. Okay, it's about to uh, make that transition. Still interesting. It's still going to be very vibrant. It's just going to be different. And you're going to be able to tell the big difference with these colors as compared to the ones we were showing before. So is the screen going to widen out? There we go. I will give this film uh, some credit because I think the colors in here are still very interesting, but it's just a very digital effect. It's in no way is it analog. This has all been processed with computers and used a ton of filters to produce this aesthetic, but this aesthetic is in no way similar to the aesthetic from the original Wizard of Oz or from Vertigo or the Red Shoes or any films that were done with uh, the Technicolor technology all in the analog domain of the time. Let's see, are there any other? Here's some uh, more interesting colors coming up. So just like what I was saying before, like you can't reproduce a digital, you can't reproduce analog color with digital. Uh, similarly, you're not going to reproduce digital color on analog, if that makes any sense. And the funny thing is, you guys have probably seen this before if you've gone to the cinemas recently, is in some cases where movie theaters haven't upgraded to digital projection, what you're going to have is still um, the film being projected on an old school film projector like 35 millimeters or whatever but it's going to be taking a digital file which has been converted to excuse me which has been converted back to like film but you can never you can never replicate the other one is what i'm trying to say so if something is shot and made entirely in digital i would recommend you probably watch it at a cinema that projects in digital if something is made on film you obviously want to do your best to watch it on film we're not going to talk in any of these videos about sort of the reasons why the move has been to digital why a lot of people are very upset about it including myself uh, but just be aware of those differences and they're not even subtle differences i mean they're pretty they're pretty major differences you look at something like this 
the color here as compared to what we have going on in this sequence. And you know, the difference is night and day there. I'm not gonna say one is better than the other, but I will say when you stare at something too long and it's digital, your eyes are going to get tired. You're going to suffer from eye fatigue, like we've talked about with ear fatigue. Something that's completely done in the analog domain, you're not gonna have that same kind of effect as quickly because it's all being done in the real world. It all makes sense to us. It's not ones and zeros. It's exactly how we process our everyday events. It's all been done by hand in the real world. Digital is all going through a computer, which isn't natural. It's not something natural for us to stare at. And that's why when you look at your computer screen for eight hours a day, I think we've all been guilty of this. You know, we feel absolutely horrible, but then we still can't even sleep because we're staring at this digital projection uh, for so long. And it's not something natural like staring at an analog projection, which is why you can watch film for 12 hours and never get super tired of it. But when you're watching something like if you're watching like all three Transformers movies back to back, you would probably uh, start suffering from a pretty serious headache um, midway through the second movie because you just aren't meant to be watching something that's digital for that long. Our brains and our eyes just can't really handle it. So to recap what we've covered here, we talked about the process of analog to digital conversion, and then of course the inverse of that, digital to analog conversion, and then I just spent a long time talking about the differences between analog signals and digital signals. Now, one thing we haven't talked about yet, but we will very shortly, is the resolution of that analog to digital conversion. So how close can we get? How um, accurate can we get? How precise? How clean? All of these things are not supposed to be meant as being good or bad, but simply relative. If you prefer the aesthetic of one sound or one image to the aesthetic or um, sound of another another sound, the aesthetic of another sound, then it's your call, it's your decision. Whatever you prefer is what you should go with always. Okay, so that's gonna do it for this lesson and I'll catch you again in the next one. Thanks a lot for watching.